This has been a huge thing that we've been um, preaching for, for a while as we've continued to grow. Um, you know, it's like Stern has seen a lot of growth, uh, especially since COVID, with businesses that are trying to keep things fresh or, um, you know, attract new, new people and new butts and seats. And uh, we've seen this huge uh, increase of people who are operating games as where they used to be enthusiasts. A lot of times they're running out of space at home and they're just looking for an excuse to put games somewhere <laughs> else, um, which, is, which is great. Um, but even, even from our point of view, like, uh, you know, finding operators and, and helping them source locations has been a big part of um, Stern's focus in the last couple years. And we're kind of getting to a point where we, we need more operators. And so we've thought that this would be a really great opportunity to talk to everyone here. And, and, and Bob is, um, he's operated machines for a very long time. And um, we just want to tell you that it might be a little bit easier than you think. So um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Bob. And um, he'll just tell you a little bit about his, his background. Yeah, good evening, everybody. I'm Bob with Paradise Pinball and Amusements. And uh, I started about 21 years ago. I bought a pinball machine in a garage sale, and Gary Stern would be happy. It was a time machine pinball that wasn't working for 350 bucks, and uh, started messing around with it. And I had played in arcade arcades when I was young. That was my grandpa. He used to pick me up at uh, Christmas and uh, breaks during the summer and take me to the arcade. He always loved to go to the arcade. And uh, so I kind of grew up with a passion for the arcade. And uh, when I found that pinball machine in a garage sale, I was like, man, that's kind of cool. Why not? Let's pick it up. So I bought it and uh, messed around with it. It kind of rekindled my passion for pinball. And uh, so I started calling around looking for places to play pinball. And this was, of course, in the early 2000s when pinball was on its way out and nobody really had pinball. Everybody wanted the fast and easy dollar, which was in video games and stuff like that. So I actually... Uh, called a bowling alley and uh, asked him, do you guys have any pinball machines? And he goes, no. And uh, he goes, I've been trying to get pinball machines in my bowling alley for years. And he goes, I can't get anybody to bring any over. So uh, I hung up the phone and uh, I had had a lawn service I was running, which I was sick of cutting grass. I was cutting about 90 lawns a week. And uh, I had just recently sold it. And uh, so I called that bowling alley owner back and I said, well, hey, how about I bring you a couple pinball machines? Didn't have a clue what I was doing. And uh, so, I went ahead and uh, he said, yeah, bring them over. So I ended up taking over Time Machine. I ended up picking up an Adams Family and a Fishtails and put them in the bowling alley. And uh, I will never forget the first time I walked into that bowling alley after about two weeks and opened that coin door and saw all those quarters sitting in that pinball machine. I was like, wow, I'm on to something here. You know, I mean, I'm not even here and these things are making money. So that was my very first location then. Uh, when I went into that location, and I put the pinball machines in there. The guy that had the arcade games got ticked and pulled all the arcade games out of there. And the bowling alley owner told me, he said, well, you're going to have to bring me arcade games. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. So this was our first location. And uh, I was also working part-time on the side or full-time on the side. And I was running my route on the side and started, you know, looking for places to put more machines in to locations. And I, it was actually easier than I thought. So... Started, you know, I got a couple bars I put some in, stuff like that. I focused on pinball. Pinball was my thing. I loved pinball. That was where I was at. So just kept re reinvesting into the locations as I was working this other job. And then when I got to about 20 to 25 locations, I thought, you know what, I can launch this. And I quit my job and went full time into the uh, arcades. And that was in uh, 2003. That was the very first pinball I bought brand new. I was so, so proud of that. That was Lord of the Rings. And, uh, so it just kept going from there. So just kept reinvesting. And then uh, the next thing you know, we're now at a stage now in our uh, career where in 2016 we opened up our own arcade. That location right there is in Cheyenne, Wyoming with a population of about 56,000 people. And uh, we have 100, 110 machines in that location. Not all pinball, of course, but uh, as you can see, we've got a really good lineup of pinball machines in there. And... Uh, and we also take care of almost 150 locations now that uh, have a lot of, we've still focused on our pinball machines. That was our, uh, that was our focus from the get-go. So, and then uh, in 2021, I was a very, very proud day. We became a distributor for Stern Pinball, as well as a lot of other lines. And uh, 
So it was amazing to me. You know, I thought when you, when you look into this industry, you see a lot of people that have been in this industry for second, third, fourth generation. But it's not that tough to, to bust into this industry. I mean, we already love pinball, right? So it gives you a niche. And a lot of these older operators may not want to run pinball machines. So it gives you an opportunity to break into some of these locations and uh, find places that you might be able to uh, put games in. So there's a lot of uh, old school versus new school operating. And this was something that we just kind of wanted to briefly touch base on. Your uh, old school operations, you know, back in the day, it used to be 50-50 split. Everybody got 50% of your cash box. Anymore, everybody knows that this stuff costs a lot of money. And they don't want to run pinball machines, and they don't want to run games in their locations. So you can really work favorable splits into your, into your, own, uh, bet, uh, onto your own side. I mean, anywhere even sometimes where a location will just be thrilled to have a pinball machine in their place and not even necessarily want any of the cash out of it just for having it. So because they're focused on making, you know, their money off of alcohol or keeping people in there, that's the key. So uh, especially nowadays that, you, you know, you're seeing a lot of more <coughs> alternative type locations um, adopting pinball for the first time. So, you know, it, it's not necessarily an arcade who's putting or bowling alley that are used, you know, used to having arcades in there. You've got these breweries, you've got record stores, you've got, you mm -hmm. know, bakeries, all types of places that are deciding to put pins in there. And to them, and even splits that, you know, like an old school operator would tell you, well, you know, it's got to be, you know, 50 50, right. where, you know, the newer, these newer locations, they're willing to take a chance, not take as much of the cut because they see the game in their location as a utility. It's something that's really attractive. It's got cool art. You've got these great themes, keeps people in there. Um, so the, the barrier of entry for them tends to be a lot lower. And it works in the operator's favor, too, I think. You're exactly right. And then <coughs> on top of that, a lot of times, too, you may be able to even go in there and say, look, you know, the first amount of X money off the top is mine because I've got to pay, you know, pay for these pinball machines. And then after that, we'll split 50-50. So it's really, you know, you get creative with it. It's th the old way of thinking is not there anymore. So, yeah, and then uh, this was a big thing, too. I mean, a lot of times it was hard to even get a single machine into a location. But if you, if you, you look at the way a location is actually starting to look at things, I mean, they want people to come in and stay, right? They want them to, to hang out, give them something to do. So it used to be, you know, maybe a single machine or two here or there. But anymore, a lot of these locations will let you put a bank of machines in, which you guys are obviously seeing with a lot of, like, the breweries and stuff, right? Yeah, because it, it, it starts to encourage leagues wanting to show up. You know, I'm sure a lot of us have gone to, you know, you use uh, the, the Insider Connected Game Locator or you go to Pinball Map and you find a place that has, like, one game in there. Um, for a novice, especially someone like me, who, like when I first started playing pinball, I was actually a little intimidated to play like one game in like a diner or something because I'm going to make a lot of noise and people are going to be looking at me. And whereas if you have a bank of games, you're, you're encouraging more people to come up there and then eventually grow into you know, bringing leagues. And that's part of the, the sales tactic and the strategy when you're approaching um, these locations and you want to say, hey, I want to put these games in here. Um, sure, I can just put one because you only have the space for the one game. But if I put five or six in here, a lot of a lot of my friends and pinball fans are going to be really attracted to come in here and and stay for longer. And and that model has proven to be much more successful, especially now. Agreed. It's almost like a destination for them to come. Yep. So. Also, something to think about, I mean, we've, you guys, I'm sure probably a lot of you have owned Williams Valley machines back in the day, and you know the maintenance that could be with them, even in your own homes, right? But a lot of the, a lot of the uh, machines nowadays, I mean, it's not frequent maintenance. I mean, these newer Stern pinball machines that we're running on our routes are incredibly reliable. And I mean, literally, if you, you know, every two, three months go in there and wax a play field, you know, and change out of rubber here or there, something like that, is really all you're going to really have to see. And when we get a little further in the slide, we'll actually show you an example of one of the machines that we bought and uh, the little service that we even had to run on it. But they are incredibly reliable anymore. Also, even with your Insider Connected now. Yeah, so. and, and it's not even just speaking to to Stern games, but just in thinking about when you're if you're going to approach this. Um, expect that if you're going to be attempting to operate games that are 30 or 40 years old, 
um, there is going to be frequent maintenance. Um, that's where the, um, the strategy of operating newer equipment is going to be a lot easier, especially if it's your first time and you're just getting your feet wet. Because even with new stuff, you're still going to have to go out and, and do some maintenance. And it's going to be a lot less than something that's got you know, years of mileage on it already. Um, but it's something to consider if, if you're, you know, you're starting to think about operating. Exactly. And also something to think about. I mean, my favorite game of all times is probably Adam's Family. But the generation that's growing up nowadays, I mean, Stranger Things is one of our best earning r machines on our routes. So, I mean, hands down, it, it can't be beat, you know. So it, it plays to a lot of different crowds. So, I mean, the machines that we might like as older players, you know, is not what's going to make, make you the money on the street. So, and it, there, there again, that kind of goes along with what we were saying here too. 100% hands-on. I mean, you were there, you were collecting the money, you know, you're maintaining your machines, and now we're we're actually starting to see exactly internet connectivity, as well as even different forms of payment, you know. So, I mean, you can take credit card now and everything like that. So, I mean, literally, you're not just collecting quarters anymore. And this really gives you a lot less of the hands-on with a pinball machine. Yeah, it, so the traditional operator um, would have to make frequent visits to their locations. And, you know, th like Bob said, I mean, he had multiple locations. And to think, you, you know, if he wants to check in on his games, I mean, he can call and say, hey, you know, I w are any of my games down? But, you know, someone in there might just say, well, we turned it off. I don't know. Someone was complaining that it was off. Um, but now with um, Insider Connected, you get alerts on your phone. You can see exactly what's going on. And that's something that we want to talk about uh, a little bit later is some of the benefits of uh, using Insider Connected and, and, the, and the pro side of it um, to, to really save yourself a lot of time and, and check on your games remotely. Yeah, it's really pretty incredible what, which, uh, wh how far it's come. So yeah. <laughs> compared to showing up to a location and going, oh, man, there's no quarters in the cash box. What happened here? And we got to try to figure it out. So, yep. Yep. It used to be, too, there again, low resale value. I mean, when I started out, I was, you know, walking into warehouses and picking up machines here and there from operators that were broke. And they were like, yeah, just get it out of here. 500 bucks, whatever, right? It used to be low resale value. But now, as we all know, Pinball has a huge resale value. So, and this is uh, going to be a really good example here. I bought this uh, Metallica here for MSRP back in the day. This was the last run that Stern did that was LED'd. And uh, I ran it for six years on the route. I had two service calls on that. I had one uh, pop uh, up kicker that had broke the plastic shaft on it and uh, had to fix it, which was no big thing. And I had another, I, I remember there was a coil that had uh, broke a piece, you know, the wire off, this, off the coil lug. So that machine, while it was on route, earned $16,000. And as we talked, I don't do 50-50 splits, so we earned a good chunk of that. Then I turned around and sold that machine here about a year and a half ago for $9,000. And that's where, you know, your return on investment is going to be huge. We all know, I mean, you give these pinballs a couple of years usually and they're out of, you know, they're, uh, they're out of uh, production and here goes the prices on them. So it's kind of a cool thing. And I mean, I didn't go into this, but when I started collecting pinball machines, which is what kind of started happening, you know, they ended up in the basement. Wife was like, no more in here. So I started looking for places to put them because I didn't want to stop collecting them. So that's a prime example of, you know, what a machine can do for you. And that's uh, that's probably just a medium machine on route for us. So, and your mileage may vary. You know, we're we're seeing lots of changes in the market all the time. Um, something that we're starting to see now is a, a more common trend, which was a little bit more taboo even five years ago, where operators who are operating premiums or premium type games on on route. Um, you know, usually you know, like at Stern, we make the pro, and the pro is like the operator's friend, you know, and it's, it's inexpensive and it's reliable, um, but the premium tends to bring more people out, and especially the enthusiasts, and those are the kind of people that are going to want to, you know, uh, take an extra five miles to, to a, you know, to a, a location that has a premium or even an LE, and that's where, you know, I think you can see, a, you know, a bigger return in the long run. Absolutely.
Absolutely, yeah. That was the last location that machine was in, was in a swipe card location. So, but yeah, and you can move that around or whatever you want to do on another machine, so. So yeah, we wanted to kind of just get into this. I mean, just kind of give you a, yeah. So that w that machine moved around to multiple locations, which is what we do. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll watch a machine as it starts to slow down after about a year or whatever. You know, the regulars have seen it a lot of times. We'll move it. That machine was probably moved, I'd say, probably three or four times in the time that it was on, on route. Was it what? So, yeah, that machine was, uh, I'm trying to think where we had that exactly. I know it was by itself at the last location. And then usually with two or three, four machines, you know, together with it. I know it did uh, have a, t a stent in our arcade for a while, too. So it did really well there. So, no, it was a pro. Yeah, it was a pro, so. So, yeah, if and we'll have a question and answer time, too, at the end. So no worries. But uh, that way, if you guys have any questions, you can definitely get them answered. But the best thing to do when you're starting out is to create a name and a logo for yourself and an email. You know, get your stickers on your machines so that people know how to get in contact with you. And then uh, apply for an LLC or something like that. You know, you want to set your business up right from the get-go. And then in, in certain cities and states, you do have to apply for a vending or, a li you know, a amusement license, which we don't have to in our states. But you need to look into that just to make sure so you're not, uh, you know, getting yourself in a bind with any of that stuff. And then really work on creating a social presence. So, you know, with Facebook, social media, you know, Twitter, all that kind of stuff. Get yourself set up on there. You can put promote your leagues, you know, new locations. And like you said, getting them on pinball map and stuff like that, right? So, yep. Yeah, and a lot of this stuff, so, we're, we're, you know, like Bob touched on, it kind of varies based on where you're, wh you know, where you live. Um, so we'll have a slide at the end. Bob's got a booth here at the show, so... And then I'll, you know, I'll give you guys cards. If you have any specific questions about these things, uh, you can reach out. But we will, we're not going to really go into a deep dive right. on this stuff. Exactly. So types of locations. I mean, we all know the arcade, right? The arcade bars. Bowling alleys are a great place. Uh, malls. You can do your own FEC type places. Breweries, like you've touched on. Yeah, breweries have been huge for us. Um, it was something that we identified um, pretty quickly that Breweries have a ton of space. Um, beer also goes really well with pinball, and not everyone drinks, but it, it's something that's really exploded over the last couple of years. And uh, again, the, the thinking about the location, uh, you know, we were able to target breweries pretty easily because they've got so much space. So we can go in there and say, hey, we can link you up with this local operator. Um, they can put five, six games in here, and then you can start a league, and um, you know, we, we've we've just seen a lot of success around that. But it's but it's key to to you know think about the location first. You may not want to. You may have a place that you love to go to, but you go in there and uh, like record shops are kind of one that I think is um, debatable. Like not they don't always work in my opinion, um, especially because a lot of people who work at record shops like to play their music when they come in. So you putting in a pinball machine, it's going to create a lot of disruption. And um, it's just something to consider, you know. Right. And look for those little spots where they might have a little bit of space that they don't know what to do with, and you can turn it into a profit for you, especially in them as well. And that's something I wanted to talk about is use your connections because, I mean, almost everybody knows somebody who manages a, you know, bar or a brewery or a restaurant or something like that. Use your connections where you might have them, you know, and – and reach out to those people and tell them, hey, this is what I do, you know, and try to find those little niche places that you can start your start your uh, amusement route in. And there again, some place that you know or maybe frequent a lot. You know, I mean, if you're in the local bar and they don't have any games, you know, hey, I can bring you some pinball machines. It's great. You know, show them what you can do, you know. So it's uh, just use your connections. Yeah, and, and starting with, with connections or some place that you know, kind of makes it a little easier on your first pitch, you know, because you got to go in there prepared and you want to be able to sell this experience. 
hey, I've got all these games and, and it's, it's going to be a utility for you. Um, you could come in there with a, a presentation, you know, something like this or, you know, have this on an iPad where you can actually sit down and show, you know, here are the games that I have and um, here's pictures of all my friends playing at this place down the street and we'd love to come over here. Um, but starting with some place you know is a good way if you're not prepared for all that yet and you don't want to put all the time into, you know, creating this, this pitch or this presentation. And that's a really good key, too, Roper. I mean, a lot of times, you know what, if you've got a group of friends that are playing, say, hey, if we bring some pinballs in here, you know, we'll come in here and have a league night, you know, once a week, and you'll get new new pe patrons through the door, right? They love to see that. So yep. use your use your connections on that right there, pitch leagues and tournaments. Yep. So. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> we kind of covered that part. Right. And then you can also offer full service. So, you know, pinball is awesome. We all love pinball. That's my passion. That's where I start. That's, I believe, pinball, right? So, but there's also other things that you can do. I mean, you can, you can provide ATMs, ATM machines, which are actually fairly easy to do. You can provide boxing machines. You know, there's a lot of different ways of being full service for that location to where you can offer more than just pinball. And that's stuff that we can help you guys with if, you know, you go into your first location. I know we've talked to you guys back there about it and you're looking at you know your pinballs in a, in a boxing machine right so it's you know you can offer a full service and it's a lot easier than you really think it, and this can be something where if you know you're, you're feeling a little bit more like maybe you've got a couple locations under your belt um, you can kind of use this to um, leverage locations that currently have operators that are only operating one type of thing so right. they might already have an operator in this location, but all they do is a, is a jukebox. Right. Um, but then you talk to the owner, and they're like, "Yeah, but you know, th he, they didn't really want to put anything else in here. We'd really love to have, uh, you know, pinball or um, anything like that." So having a, a fuller arsenal will will give you more of a leg up. Exactly. Something else we'll touch on too, and you guys can come up here if you want to afterwards. Is protective agreements. And, you know, you need to have an agreement in place with your location just in case that location might close or something like that. Even though you might think you know, you know them pretty well or you know a manager or something like that, you definitely want to have a protective agreement. And I can get you guys a generic copy of that if you're going to try to go into a location. You know, I actually, uh, I lo how I learned this was the hard way. I lost a pool table in a tattoo shop that closed. I should have known better probably, but... <laughs> But uh, they closed, and they pulled the pool table out in the dark, and I lost the pool table. So the, the police officer told me, he said, hey, you need to have an agreement in place with the driver's license. That's the only way we can track them down. But like I said, I can get you guys a generic copy of that, and you guys can kind of give you something to go off of. I could. The li did you say liability insurance or something? Yeah, so I have a, I have an umbrella on mine, and I also in my agreements have it written under my agreements that the machine is covered under their their insurance because my machines are actually on location at their place. My insurance company won't insure me with with them being in somebody else's location. So that's written right in the agreement that you know if there's a theft, fire, flood, whatever else, my machines are covered under their their building insurance. It's a good question though. Yes. So that's where my umbrella comes in. I do have I have an umbrella policy that that protects me for hopefully right for that if something does happen. So, thank goodness in 21 years we haven't had an issue. So, knock on wood, right? We yeah, have, exactly. We, we haven't seen any pinball machines fall on people. Yeah, I do know a friend though that forgot to uh, latch his back la back box and it oh. fell down and broke a kid's hand. Oh. So, yeah. So, and uh, you know. Take the safety precautions when you're putting them out there. Make sure your head bolts are in or, you know, your bolts are tight so somebody, some little kid don't mess around and end up dropping something down on them. So, so um, just circling back on, on the breweries, um, again, from with Stern, breweries have been a huge focus for us, uh, not because we, we love beer, but we've seen a lot of success. <laughs> and um, so we have this, this series that we've been putting on YouTube um, and uh, – Brewcade Hopping, and so we have them on YouTube. You guys can check them out. I want to play one real quick. Um, you know, it's not so much a promo as it is 
uh, another tool. So again, when we were like talking about going in and, and making pitches, um, these are really, like this whole video series is a really great resource for operators who want to go into a location and, and say, here's what I'm trying to bring to you. And um, a, a, almost every video that we've done is a story that talks about a location that never had pinball machines or probably wasn't, they weren't even pinball fans to start and grew to love it. And then the operators are excited because they have this cool new location. So uh, we'll, we'll just watch a short video real quick. Are you okay? Hi, my name is Sean Hunt. I'm the founder and owner of Mustang Sally Brewing Company, and welcome. So how did I start the brewery? So early on, 20 years ago, I wanted to do this, you know, right from the get-go. It took a long time, it took me going to law school, it took me being a lawyer for 20 years, and then ultimately I got to the point where I could do it. And I actually opened up the brewery, and I've really had no regrets ever since. My passion for beer, I think it's an evolving thing. And I lived in Germany for a little while. I love those traditional styles. Um, and then as we were opening up the brewery, that's exactly what we started out with, what we were doing Six years ago when we opened, what we're doing right now is vastly a different um, kind of a thing. Um, right now, we, we love sours and, you know, IPAs, of course, stouts, you know, it's, it's kind of everything that you would think is creative. Our head brewer is Sasha Kingri, a chemist, you know, by background, and just a super creative person that does a really great job making beer. So I actually went to school for chemistry. I was a career chemist for a long time and then decided I want to do something more fun. So I started brewing. I've been to two different breweries and now I'm here and we get to make all the fun beer I can imagine. The fact that Sasha and I both have backgrounds in uh, lab chemistry makes it really easy to work together, especially when we're talking about the finer points of experimenting, but also about the, the chemical processes that happen in brewing. Brewing has become more experimental and just trying to figure out how the flavor profiles are going to develop. Um, all of that comes back to science, experimentation, mathematics. You can know all the science, but if you don't have the art, you will not make a good beer. And the same is true if you're an artist who doesn't have the science. It all just kind of comes full circle. You know, my favorite beer in the end is going to be that really elegant lager. But do I have the most fun with that? I think the, the beer that I have the most fun with right now are probably sours. We have a key lime pie imperial sour right now. The idea of a beer really tasting like a key lime pie would have kind of made my head explode, I think, about two years ago. Now I really love that. So all these ideas are just coming from the fact that I'm a little fat kid at heart. I absolutely love eating, I love pastries, and what better way to express that than in my beers. So our dessert sours, we have two that we frequently come out with. It's our crumb series, which is, we'll do a blueberry whoopie pie, and then we also have another series called loaded. So we don't discriminate by solely doing um, pastry stouts. Sometimes we're gonna throw herbs in there, you know, a little bit of sea salt. So we actually utilize that in our freak series. So we're coming up with these names based on whatever cockamamie idea comes into our head. There's really no rhyme or reason. Sometimes you come up with the beer and then the name. Sometimes you come up with the name and then the beer. So early this year, we came up with a beer called Pinball Lizard. You know, we've been doing pinball in here for a couple of years now, and uh, we really wanted to lean in on it. And then, you know, going from a small batch beer to actually naming one of our big batch beers, Pinball Lizard, was kind of a big step for us. When we first started here, we had about just a couple of pinball machines, and we didn't think that pinball would be as big as a hit as it is today. Early on, we had a friend, and he said, hey, you ought to bring in a couple of pinball machines. And so we brought in a couple of pinball machines, and it was just a wild success. And, and so then we added a couple more, and then a couple of more. Now we got 17 pinball machines. We have a pinball league every Tuesday night. Just such a tight community that we see them coming back day after day after day, and it's amazing. 
Pinball is part of the identity of this location now. It's a key league location. We love the beer here. It's just the perfect combination. And we were the first brewery in this area to have pinball machines. And the thing that I noticed is that every brewery in the area now has pinball machines. We do pinball tournaments every month and we're actually gonna have one tonight and it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, we're expecting anywhere from 60 to 80 people to show up for this tournament and it'll be a blast. What keeps me coming back to this location is it's a great spot. There's a lot of space to hang out and have a snack or drink. And there's lots of different pinball machines here, lots of variety, um, lots of new games, lesser games, a lot of uh, old games that are harder to find other places. So here at Mustang Sally, uh, we have pinball leagues on Tuesday nights all skill levels that's the most important part is it's all skill levels so a uh, lot of fun a lot of new players that really happen to be part of the team though and, you know at a brewery especially having this many games here it's fun that's for sure <laughs> So with Insider Connected, it's expanded on the concept of league play and competitive play. Players want to compete in general, and having the concept of a leaderboard, which was just in introduced to the brewery, is fantastic because if I walk by the leaderboard as a player, let alone an operator, I want to put my name up there. I don't want to see someone else's name on the leaderboard. So you know, as players, we're probably going to play more, and we're going to share our results, and not just on an individual game, but you know, across the entire location. Everything in this, this tap room should be energy. Yeah, I mean, right? that pretty much the beers uh, that we're making, how we serve things. the beers. Yeah, that, that pretty much covers it. But again, so we have um, a whole, s this whole series is on our YouTube uh, page. Uh, we, we've, I think we've done six or seven of these. But this is, a, again, a great tool that you can actually bring into a location and show them, um, you know, these are really testimonials more than anything you know like we put it out as like a marketing video and we want to show off um, you know how how this has been a, a successful program but for from an operator's point of view um, you've got some really strong testimonials in every single one of these videos and I think it it, it shows the uh, the vision pretty clearly yeah that's very true and then things to uh, help you with your route I mean tool bags spare parts we all have that anyway because we uh, take care of our games, right, at our houses or wherever else. We touched on cashless options a little bit, and that's that's huge. I mean, a lot of these, you know, with the pinball machines and to go off of uh, Insider Connect, I can actually click on my Pro Insider Connect account, and I can see exactly how much money is in, in, in each one of my machines, how much play they've had. And uh, so cashless options is definitely a thing of the future. You want to make sure you for sure have a bill acceptor on your on your pinball machine at, at the very least, but uh, cashless options are actually fairly cheap and you can take credit card, you know, and that money gets deposited right into your account, right off the machine, so. Yeah, there was a, a location that I visited um, during one of, uh, just like in the last couple months, and it w you know, we went in there and they had a couple of our newer games and then some older ones, and they had bill acceptors on the newer Stern games, but the older titles, still only took coin and then there was no change machine and then they did also didn't have an ATM so from a player's or a customer's point of view I didn't really have a good way to play all these games I had a couple bucks and I was able to you know break some bills and play the ones that had bill acceptors but I had no way to make change to play the other games so it's something that you really have to think about when you're approaching this is um, you know are you providing all the resources here for everyone to be able to play these games in this location? And going cashless is just one of those ways that's just become a lot easier. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And a lot of kids are not going to go up to a bartender or, or somebody at the restaurant and ask for change. They're not going to do it. So you want to make it as easy as possible for them to be able to play these machines. So, And then that leads us to Insider Connected. Yeah, so um, just to give you guys a little bit of background um, on myself, and I'll try to keep this brief because we're running a little short on time, but um, 
I started off in the in the bar industry. I worked in location for about eight years. Um, and when I started working at Stern, um, I helped out with the Stern Army. And now I am uh, helping operators. So I, I connect with operators and I teach them about Insider Connected and, and ways that we can use this tool to enhance your locations and uh, ultimately uh, increase your earnings uh, and keep your, your players happy. Um, so right now I just want to walk through um, the submission process for applying for a Insider Connected Pro uh, membership. So a lot of people, the more people I talk to about this don't realize this, but Insider Connected was not only made with the player in mind. So, you know, when we first started pitching it, it's the Xbox Live for pinball. You can earn achievements. We have badges. We have badges here at the show today that you get for playing at certain times. Um, but there's a really robust um, resource for operators as well. And we've, we've that was always made from the beginning. Um, so to at least in, in order to apply for a Insider Connected Pro membership, you first just need your, your regular Insider Connected player uh, ID. So that's kind of the first step. If you have a player ID, you're already pre-qualified to sign up for a pro membership, um, but then with, with, a, with a couple of caveats. So um, you just go to our website. We have um, a, a, you know, a pro page on there, and then you just click apply today. Uh, a little application is going to pop up um, asking you what your business name and, and the address is, and then um, that stuff will actually come to us, and we're going to review the information that was sent. One of the first things that we're looking for is that you have a verified location. Um, so if you have a couple games in your house and all your friends come over every you know Saturday and play games, um, we don't qual that doesn't qualify as a verified location. It needs to be a public location. So um, you know, please consider that before submitting an application. You want to have you already want to be through this whole process and have games in a location before submitting your application. Um, then we're looking at only Spike Two games, at least uh, you know, n not exclusively Spike Two, but um, Insider Connected won't work on Spike One games. So. Um, yeah, and if I can touch on that too, verified locations are really v big for uh, for operators. I mean, uh, so our arcade that I showed you pictures of, Flippers, we have uh, all the Insider Connected games at that location, and we actually have players that, when we f when they find out we've got a new title in there, they'll they'll bring a bus up from uh, Denver, 120 miles away, and spend the day in our arcade just chasing achievements. So, yep. as a verified location, they want those verified achievements. You yeah. know, so it's like an extra perk. Yep. Um, and then we also check your AMOA member status. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with it or with the AMOA, um, we'll talk about it a little bit at the end. Um, but if you are an AMOA member, you're, you're, you're basically approved immediately. So um, next, we're just going to cover a couple things uh, in, in navigating the dashboard, um, how to add locations to your account, how to register your games, um, navigating the dashboard, and then creating leaderboards. Um, so here we have the desktop view and then the mobile view. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, we're just going to continue in desktop mode, but you can do this on your phone as well. Um, so uh, when you have your, your, your player account your, and you sign up for Insider Connected Pro, you're going to see this new Pro section um, on your dashboard. So by default, you're logging in into your player account, but then you can switch over into your operator account. And then it's going to look like this. So now you have like all these different locations that are set up. So these are different bars or different arcades. And you can get like a little bird's eye view of, uh, of what's going on with your games. Um, you just go up here and you hit add new a location. Uh, you fill out that location information and that's pretty much it. So that it's just that easy to add locations to your account. Um, then once you have your location set up, you want to register your game. So you put a Stranger Things in there, you put a Venom, you've got a Bond in there. You have to register. You have to tell those games that they are set up at that location. So you'll just go in here and find the location that you you just created, and then you have to go. You have to be physically at your machine in order to do this. Um, but you want to open up the service menu. Um, you'll go over to the uh, Net feature, um, and once you're in Net. Um, you have to connect the game to the internet, which you can do via an Ethernet cable or via Wi-Fi. Um, you'll take your, you'll go down to the Insider Connected portion, and then you take the QR code that you would use 
like you were going to scan in and play a game. And now that QR code has kind of been upgraded to your operator profile. So when you scan the game, it's actually going to know, you know, that you want to register that game to your location, and then you just assign it to which location you, uh, you, you, the location that you're registering it to. Yeah, and this might seem like it might be a little bit of a big task, but it's actually once you've done this about once or twice, it's five minutes. I'll walk into a location, I'll scan, connect to the internet. Stern has made it so easy with your, you know, your wireless connection, and you can s you can get your games right up online. It takes you <laughs> literally about five minutes to do so. Yep. So, um, something that we want to point out on your dashboard. So now you've got, you know, a couple locations, or maybe you only have one location in here. Um, I want to show you what it looks like if you want to check on the status of your location. So um, for the purpose of this demonstration, we'll go into our, our craft brewers conference that we were at earlier this year, and this is what it's going to look like. Um, and one of my favorite things on here are the play trends. So this is really just giving you a macro view of what your location is looking like. So again, going back to the old school mentality, it was, it was a trip. You had to go to that location and check the cash box. And that was really the only way you'd know how your machines were earning. Um, you could call, but then you know someone's gonna need a key and get into your game, and then you don't know if you can trust them to open the game and check, you know. Um, but this is actually telling you right off the bat, you know, uh, what your trends are looking like. And seeing something with a huge drop, um, that might give you an alert, like, oh, wow, there's, there's a huge decrease in my, in my play trends. There might be something going on. Maybe the, the location turned off the game or moved it for an event or something like that. Um, so it's, it's been a really valuable tool. Um, the next thing I want to point out, and it, we kind of covered this already, but were the um, operator tech alerts. So right here we can see that you know Ninja Turtles has one alert, and um, again you don't have to go into the location to actually find this alert now. It's um, now currently our our uh, Insider Connected Pro dashboard does not have push notifications. Um, that's something that we're working on in the future, so you do have to be proactive and check this. But um, it's a huge time saver to be able to go in here and see the status of your game, and it's it's pretty detailed. So I clicked on this. Um, just for demonstration purposes, it's a it's a venom here, um, but you can see the current alerts. It says check switch 74. You know, it's very specific about the information that it's giving you. So when you are packing your tool bag and you're going to go and 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 service your game, you you're prepared because um, I know Gavin over here, who I've known for many years and services a lot of games, and he's an operator. Um, I used to call him out to my bar all the time and. He's a pro. He's got a van that has everything in it. He's got locks. He's got, you know, rubber bands and switches for all types of games. Um, you getting into this and, and being new, you, you might not have all this stuff at your arsenal. So having that, that foresight and being able to see what exactly is wrong with the game before you get in um, just makes you better prepared. Bless you. And lastly, uh, how to create a leaderboard. So leaderboards have been um, a, a instrumental into creating more awareness in these locations. Um, if you go out and to the show floor and you see our booth, you'll see that we have this really dynamic display on a, on a TV where we have our leaderboard, we have um, you know uh, pictures promoting our, our seminars for today, we've got videos, and um, you can do all of that with, with the TV and having the leaderboard. So that's something that we can also discuss later because we're just getting a little short on time, but um, just want to show you guys how to set up your leaderboard. So assuming we went through that whole process, we set up your location, you got your games registered, you go into your location and you select leaderboards and uh, you'll have a new little window that opens up here. You just hit new leaderboard and after that you have you can create the name of the leaderboard you can create the start time and the end time and what titles you want on there um, this is where you can get creative uh, because not every location is going to have the same kind of players so you might have a location where you only have casual players so running a a leaderboard that lasts maybe only a month a casual player might go in there and and, and be bummed that I made it on the leaderboard, but it's gone already. Um, versus like uh, an enthusiast location where you have, you know, let's say Raymond Davison is, is going to your location and he's blowing up every game. Um, 
you might want to refresh your leaderboard more frequently to give other people opportunities to make it on there. Um, so it's it's something to think about. There's no one way to do it. Um, a great, you know, I, I, what I would recommend is to talk to other operators who are running leaderboards or even just tournaments um, or any of our Facebook, like we have an, uh, a Stern Army Facebook group, uh, an Insider Connected Pro Facebook group. Um, these are great places to kind of open up that dialogue and, and get some ideas of how to best um, tackle uh, a leaderboard. Yes. Um, so just a couple of resources we want to talk about before we wrap up and take some questions. Um, Stern Army is a huge resource. So if you plan on, on um, setting up, you know, you, you got your location and you're, um, you're, you want to set up tournaments and leagues and stuff like that, and especially launch parties. Michael Grant's in the back here. Um, he's he's the, the head of the Stern Army. Um, you won't find anyone who is more passionate about this stuff than Michael Grant. So and he um, does an awesome job. He does a great <laughs> job. So um, you can email him there. And then, um, yeah, Bob? Yeah, and then the AMOA, for those of you who do don't know what the AMOA is, Roper touched on that for a second. So if you're an AMOA member, you're automatically, you know, you vetted right through to a pro account. The AMOA is something that's near and dear to my heart. I joined the board nine years ago. I'll be president of it this year. And uh, it's a group of operators. It's over almost 1,000 across the country, and it's a massive resource for starting out. When I joined the AMOA nine years ago, just to give you guys an idea, I had about 40 locations. And now, like I said, we're running 150 locations, our own FEC. We're doing distribution. I met all these great people in this industry. So that is an absolute wonderful thing to uh, get a part of. Uh, it's the AMOA actually offered, for being as we're doing this with you guys, Six month free trial membership. You can get on there. They have they have uh, webinars. They have all sorts of different stuff that you guys can take advantage of as you know trying to become new operators. So there it is. It's a six month uh, trial membership. And like I said at the end, you guys can come up and see me. I can get you an application, and you guys can. Oh. And we have applications at the booth too as well. Thank you, Damon. But yeah, you guys can get a picture of that. We're at booth 315, so you guys can come by there. It's free. You can join. You can check it out and see what's there. There's tech videos on there. There's all sorts of different stuff. And then we also uh, had real quick there, we were just showing you guys, there's actually a tech school that you guys can go to for learning some of this different stuff. Uh, you know, working on pinball machines, ATMs, stuff like that, stuff that you guys might have questions about. It's really for the new operator, and it's really an awesome deal. They travel across the country. There's three a year. We try to do them all the way across the country. That way you guys can take advantage of that. It's really, really a great thing. So, And with that, we uh, have Q&A, so question and answer. Yep, uh, right up the middle, triple. Yodek player? You're looking at it. Just call me. We'll just come see me. I'll give you a card. We'll we'll talk all about it. How do you rotate them physically? Um, so it, depending on the device that you're using, the Yodek player actually allows you to create playlists. So you have to you have different media that you can upload. You can upload a static image, videos. Our our leaderboards operate on web on a website. So it's a URL that you're copying in there, and it has a, you know when you're uploading your media, it says URL or web web page. So you just copy the link to the leaderboard, put it in there, and then um, when you're creating your playlist, you can have as many items in there as you want and mix and match it and make it as dynamic as you want. But yeah, let's talk. Uh, right behind you. Uh, yep. So ultimately that comes down to you truthfully and if you show that you're valuable to that location you're in there taking care of the equipment you're not going to have much of an issue at all so you know when i first started i mean it was more competitive and stuff like that now people understand the cost of these machines and stuff like that and if you if you're in there and you're talking to those location owners and maintaining the equipment you're really not going to have that much of a problem i lose locations now and then from you know, closures and stuff like that, but very rarely do we ever lose a location to someone else coming in and doing better. Gary? Yep. 
So I've mostly done with all my pinball machines. I tell them straight up there's a lot more maintenance in them, even though there's not anymore. <laughs> so I tell them that. <laughs> they see, they look, they, th all you got to do is lift up a play field, and they see the bottom of that play field and go, oh, my word. And it's like, yep, exactly, right? So even though they're not that much of a maintenance, I, t I do straight up either. Th I try to go to a 30-70 split on my pinball machines. Give them something. Give them a little something. You know, that way some other operator doesn't walk in there and say, what, you're not getting anything? You know, well, I'll give you 20%, and then out you go then. So give them something. Show them that you're valuable. That's what you want to do. I'd say probably top mistake for an oper a new operator would be something like not offering a split. You know, and sometimes, I mean, these locations don't know, right? So you walk in there and look, this costs a lot of money. You're setting yourself up to get knocked out of the right out. So that's that's a big thing. I haven't seen a lot of operators that have failed, truthfully. I mean, because what you don't see is, is a lot of the operators are, like I said, second, third, fourth generation, right? So they've got their, their setup already ready to go. You do, the newer operators, though, the pitfalls that you really want to avoid is make sure you have that agreement in place. Don't call it a contract. Call it an agreement, you know, and walk in there. Just set yourself up for success. And like I said, guys, I know we're running out of time here, but come up, get our cards. I know, Nick, we've been working with you, you know, trying to help you. And he knows. I mean, we're a phone call away. you got to just pick up the phone and ask a question. We're there. So Yeah, we, we can also meet outside, too, yeah. uh, in, in the lobby Absolutely. if you guys want to ask more questions. We got Gary. Uh-huh. You're exactly right. Yes. Yeah, Gary said make sure and have an agreement in place so that they don't try to boot you out because these things are in place for like usually three to five years. They will. <laughs> they will. You're exactly right. Very good point. They uh, will. I, th I think that's our time. You guys want to meet yeah. meet us out in the lobby here, and we'll uh, we'll happily talk to you guys with more questions or whatever you yeah. have. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank